Welcome to episode 241 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Richard Velasquez, who served in the FBI for nearly 26 years. Assigned to the Dallas field office his entire career, Rick spent his first four years in Dallas and then the last 21 years in the Plano Frisco Resident Agency, where he specialized in and managed an intensive caseload of complex financial crime investigations. In this episode, Rick reviews his Disney theme park fraud case against Thomas Lucas Jr., who concocted a story that the Disney company would build a theme park called Frontier Disney DFW in North Texas. Lucas Jr. used this false information to solicit doctors, lawyers, professional athletes, and others into investing in the land surrounding the alleged Disney site assuring them that when Disney announced plans for the theme park, the new landowners would become instant millionaires. Investors lost over $60 million in the scheme. Rick Velasquez is the author of Texcot, Dreams, Lies, and Fraud, his account of the FBI investigation that finally brought Thomas Lucas Jr. to justice. In addition to his fraud cases, Rick also worked violent crimes and was a member of the SWAT team for 10 years and on the crisis management team for two years, assisting in the coordination of command posts for high-profile cases and major sporting events. After retiring from the FBI, Rick formed Baird Velasquez and Associates Incorporated, a consulting and private investigation company specializing in complex financial investigative matters. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. It's been a tough week. I've been contemplating what, if anything, I was going to say about the tragic news concerning the two FBI managers who failed to protect USA gymnasts from sexual abuse and assault. I've been angry and a little bit demoralized and so sad for these young girls since I heard the news. But of all things, to remind me to keep my head up and continue my mission to show you who the FBI is, was a TV show. Actually, three shows. FBI, FBI Most Wanted, and FBI International. A three-hour epic CBS TV event that was on last night. I was planning to do my usual thing, review the shows for policy and procedural accuracy, But instead, this morning, I wrote CBS an open letter of appreciation. Those shows couldn't have aired at a more opportune time for the FBI. Thank you, FBI, CBS. I'll include a link to my letter to CBS in your podcast app's description of this episode, along with a link inviting you to join my reader team, where once a month I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. Thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Richard Valakez. Hey, Rick, how you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you, Jerry. Well, I want you to know that I just finished reading your book, Texcot, which I know from reading the book is a take on Epcot, which everybody knows is a theme park in Disney. And so the book is about this particular case that involved Disney, but really had absolutely nothing to do with the actual Disney Corporation. Yeah, that's that's correct. It was uh, the misuse of the Disney brand that Lucas used. Well, I really enjoyed the book, and I can't wait to talk more about the case, because as everyone knows, I worked most of my career on an economic crime squad, and so I really, really enjoy the fraud and conman type case reviews. So where should we start? Should we start at the point where the FBI gets involved or should we start at the point where this whole thing takes off? I think it'd be a good idea to start where 
the whole thing took off, you know, give a little background about Lucas, his early life, and, and then move on up to when the victim finally came into the FBI. So I'm going to tell you a, kind of a little story, you know, it has a little play on phrases that Disney uses. It's a true FBI story. It's the promise of a Disney theme park. Dreams became nightmares through lies, eagerly accepted by the victims, and then fraud erased the uh, investors' hope of living happily ever after. Thomas Lucas Jr., and I'm probably going to try to refer to him as Tom or Lucas, he grew up in a in a city with a reputation of being very pretentious. It's an affluent city. It's a suburb of Dallas. The city is called Plano, Texas, and it's actually my hometown. Plano, Texas got national notoriety back in the 90s for a couple of tragedies. One was a black tar heroin tragedy. A lot of high school kids were overdosing on black tar heroin. And then another one was a kidnapping of a seven-year-old girl named Ashley Estelle who got abducted and murdered. So it got national attention uh, really quick back in the 90s. The type of town that Plano is, there's a lot of pressure in the town to keep up with the Joneses. And what I mean by that, there's pressure to perform athletically, academically, and, you know, just, just with your arts. Whatever it is, you're trying to outdo your friends. That was a reputation of Plano, Texas. So Thomas was no exception. He was always trying to outdo his friends. And the way he did this was through lies. He would make things up that were really ridiculous. And in talking to some of his high school friends, I got a couple of stories or examples of some of the lies he told. Thomas Lucas Jr. was like every other kid. He grew up. He played football. He had a circle of friends he hung out with. He had a girlfriend that he dated in high school. And in talking to these friends, some of the lies they conveyed to me was one example was his girlfriend. He had a date with his girlfriend. and. Thomas Lucas Jr. told her that he could score some tickets to the Dallas Stars Stanley Cup playoff game. Back in 98, the Dallas Stars were in the Stanley Cup. And his girlfriend was a big fan, and she was really excited. So, yes, yeah, of course, she wanted to go. Well, on the Friday night that Lucas came to pick her up, she comes running out to the car, gets in, and he looks at her and says, did you get the tickets? And she's looking at him saying, you know, why would I get the tickets? And Lucas said, well, my friend was supposed to call you and drop him off. Did he do that? And she's like, well, why on earth would your friend call somebody he didn't know and drop off tickets when he knew you? She instantly knew this is one of his typical type of lies. She ended up getting over it because she figured this was just Lucas being Lucas. Another example was Tom used to work at a uh, blockbuster video store back in the 90s when he was in high school. And his best friend was the manager. His best friend actually testified at our trial. But on a Friday night, Lucas was supposed to report to work, and he shows up about an hour late. So his friend is kind of a little upset because he's very busy. And he goes and says, Tom, where on earth have you been? He goes, well, I'm sorry. You know, my mom's got stage four cancer, and she's dying. So I wanted to spend some time with her. So his friend, you know, accepts that, and, you know, he feels bad for Tom. So it's no big deal. Well, about a month later, the friend's over at Lucas's house, and he sees his mom. So he goes up, and he gives her a hug and says, you know, I'm really sorry about your diagnosis. And she just looks at this guy like he's just lost his mind and says, what are you talking about? I'm not sick. I don't have cancer. So instantly, this friend knew that Lucas was just making up another lie. You know, another example was Lucas used to brag about how he had this hot car the Mustang Cobra. And none of his friends ever saw it, but they always had to hear about it almost every day. Well, one time a friend was over there at his house and said, hey, where's your car? Tom would make up things previously that, you know, my relatives were always buying it. Well, he knew the heat was about to come down on him. So he said, you know, we sold it because we couldn't afford the insurance on it. So again, all his friends knew this was the typical Thomas Lucas lie. Well, I know from your book, the con that he eventually started, he didn't involve his friends. And you can tell why. They they all knew not to believe anything he said. Just amazing that you have someone who feels this need to make these elaborate false stories up. Right. It was typical. They would say he lied, but he was harmless with his lies. 
until 2005. But again, he was just trying to keep up with the Joneses. All these other, you know, all his other friends were excelling. You know, one even became a doctor. One became an attorney. And, you know, they're excelling. And he had nothing going in his life. So he would make up lies to fit in with these guys. I'm going to get to 2005 where this started. But before I do that, I'm going to give you a little history on Disney World because this whole scheme was based on the history of Disney World. Back in the 60s, Walt Disney came up with this idea to build a theme park in Orlando, Florida. Walt Disney knew that he could not go there and say, Disney wants to buy all this land because the cost would be outrageous. So what he did was make up shell companies. One such company was called M as in the letter, T as in the letter, Lot, L-O-T-T. If you put it together, it says empty lot. That was one of the such companies that he (laughs) went out there to buy land through. Okay, And the purpose of him doing this was when the community there found out Disney was in town buying land, all the real estate investors and real estate developers would go out there and try to buy land around it because they knew the value of the land would just increase dramatically. To give you a picture of this, the rumor was when Walt Disney bought his first acre of land out there, he paid 8000 an acre. And by his last acre of lot that he bought out there, he paid 80000 an acre. You can see wow. it goes up exponentially. Yeah. A Florida reporter finally broke the story that Disney was coming to town. And Walt Disney confessed, finally said, yeah, we are coming to town. But the whole point of Walt Disney hiding his purchase in the development of a theme park was based on the announcement. And the announcement was was vital. Once the announcement came, Disney is buying property. Everybody wants to get land around it. So that's what this whole premise of Lucas's scheme is based on Disney coming to town and the announcement that Disney will make. Did Lucas know about this history, know about the increase in price of the real estate? Or is that kind of something that most real estate speculators would know? No, it's not something most real estate speculators would know. And Lucas knew about it, but he only knew about it in 2005. One of the friends had told me, one of the high school friends had told me, Lucas was a guru on the internet. Okay. This is, you know, you're talking back in the nineties, the computer, the laptop. This is all new. I mean, you think about when we worked for the bureau in the nineties, you know, we had these big green screen computers. We were a little behind the time. Someone like Thomas a little. Lucas Jr. <laughs> yeah. Someone like Thomas Lucas Jr., they said he was a guru. He knew how to do things on the computer nobody even dreamed about doing, you know, until the 2000s. So he was kind of ahead of his time. He knew how to research things. He knew how to set up blogs, which came into play later on. But he was, he was just a genius on the computer. So it wasn't very hard for him just to research the Internet and find out the history of Disney, which is how he came up with this scam. So let's move to 2005. 2005, Lucas is 26 years old. He's working for the family real estate business. His father and his uncle owned a uh, real estate company called the Harry B. Lucas Real Estate Company. Wasn't very big, probably 10 employees, but Lucas was the gopher there. He did anything he was told. He did anything he was asked. Basically, he fixed the computers when an employee had a problem with it, not moving up or whatnot. So that was his job. At some point in 2005, the uncle came over to Lucas Jr. and said, Hey, man, you're pretty much useless to this company, so we're going to fire you. I had interviewed the uncle as part of the investigation, and the uncle described Lucas as he wasn't motivated. He was a gopher. He was a smart, bright man, but he couldn't apply himself to anything. Is that Uncle Chip? That is Uncle Chip. Yes, it is. Uncle Chip painted a picture that this guy brought nothing to the table. So Uncle Chip fired Lucas in the spring of 2005. What about Lucas's dad? He was he owned the company, right? Yeah, he was part owner with the with Uncle Chip. The dad didn't fight it. The dad knew that his son was useless to the company, not bringing in any income. So, yeah, he went along with it. The dad wasn't real strong. When I tried to talk to him, my interpretation is he wasn't real strong. He probably knew Lucas was heading down a path of something like this, just not to the extent. But, yeah, he didn't fight the termination. In fact, what he described it as is, well, my son wasn't fired. He was just 
let go because we didn't have enough money to pay him. And, you know, I'm scratching my head thinking, what's the difference? You're not working for the company anymore. So I agreed to say, okay, he was terminated. Anyway, he's fired in an effort to try to save his job. He makes up this story and tells his uncle, Chip, hey, there's a big company moving into North Texas. There could be some business there. And Uncle Chip looks at him and says, well, you know, you had more detail like who the company was. That might be beneficial to us. But you just give us a rumor. Yeah, that doesn't do anything for us. So goodbye. So Lucas leaves the, the company. And then later that spring of 2005, Lucas attends a uh, bachelor party in Austin, Texas. The party was a high school friend. The friend ended up becoming a doctor down in Austin, attended the University of Texas. And uh, Lucas and a couple of high school friends went to this bachelor party. And other invitees of the bachelor party included the doctor's fraternity brothers at UT. So there's probably 10 to 15 people at the bachelor party. Okay. Now, Austin, Texas is a small town about three and a half hours south of Dallas. It's a college town. It's a real artsy kind of town. A lot of live bands, a lot of outdoor activity, jogging, cycling, everything like that. It's kind of an oasis in Texas. They go down there. They do the usual debauchery you find at bachelor parties for guys. Back in those days, at least. A lot of drinking, getting drunk, going to strip clubs, having strippers come back and dance for you at your hotel. So that's the kind of thing that was going on. Friday night, they went to the strip club. Saturday, they went tubing down the Guadalupe River, which is about 30 minutes south of Austin. And while they were tubing there, the brother of the doctor, he started talking to Lucas and he asked Lucas what he did. Lucas was bragging about how he's a big real estate agent, which he was not. He didn't have a license. And he bragged about how the month before this bachelor party, he had been in the Cayman Islands sail surfing down there for the whole month. And the doctor's brother is like, yeah, you're a little overweight. You got no tan. You weren't anywhere in the Cayman Islands. Okay. So he knew this guy was lying. I mean, this is this is typical of Lucas. Anyway, when the weekend was over, that Monday morning, Lucas barges into his father's office where Uncle Chip was there, too, and says, it's business. And they go, what are you talking about? The big company that's coming to Texas is Disney. They plan on building a theme park. And we can make a lot of money if we start buying that land. So they question it. How do you know it's Disney? And Lucas says, well, while I was at the bachelor party, I met an old high school friend who works for Disney, and he's given me insider information. Okay, so Uncle Chip and the father, they don't do any due diligence. They see the money, the cha-ching here, and they start trying to put investors together so they can go buy land. Hold up for a minute. All okay. of his friends, all of Lucas's, Tom, Lucas, whatever we're calling him, all of his friends know that he is a habitual liar. Yeah. How come his father and his uncle don't know that? How come they don't suspect that he's making this all up? Jerry, two things. So for the father's point of view, I can only feel as a father, you want to trust your kid. And, and that's the excuse for the father. Uncle Chip, who I actually got to interview, I believe he didn't care if it was made up. He saw a chance to put investors together and make money. Okay. So it was a greed thing for Uncle Chip. I think it was a love thing for the father, a trust thing. So yeah, they did no, absolutely zero due diligence. And when they started having investor presentations, they would ensure that all the investors sign a confidentiality clause and that they would do no due diligence on this, that they would rely on the presentations, the things that they were presenting to them. That's how I guess he got it past the family. Anyway, the uncle said, okay, well, we're going to have to get some things from your inside source. And they go, first of all, who is it? And Lucas says, well, like I said, it's a high school friend, but I'm never going to divulge his idea. I gave him my word. I would never, ever do that. So the uncle and the father accepted that. August rolls around. The bachelor party was in May. August rolls around. 
And Uncle Chip is saying, hey, I'm reaching out to some people. I'm trying to get interested investors. I need some proof from your insider. Can he get us anything? So Lucas responds, well, I haven't seen him since the bachelor party, but I'll try to reach out to him and see if I can get something. So that's the first red flag right there, Jerry, that when I came into the investigation later on, and I wouldn't get into the investigation until 2012. So we're talking seven years later. But that was the first clue to me is if you went to the bachelor party, doesn't it make sense you would have went to the wedding? And if you went to the wedding, wouldn't you have seen your high school inside source of Disney at the wedding? OK, uh, and discuss this again. That that. That question never came up to anybody. That's because they're not trained investigators like you are. <laughs> yeah. You know, let me thump my chest a little bit. But no, <laughs> I, I, I thought it was just something that, you know, I, I once told a uh, chief of police here in Plano, I said, look, what we do is not rocket science. We just have common sense and we know where to go with the next question or the next lead. And maybe that's based on experience. I don't know. Anyway, that was that was a question. Well, about a month later. Lucas produces this email with two attachments. And the email was from quote unquote G Man, G apostrophe M A N. And this is one of the first things that Lucas said he thought he lived a world of espionage or FBI agent or what. So he concocts this email by himself. He writes it to himself and he signs it G Man at yahoo.com or google.com, whatever. And then he produces this email to his Uncle Chip. And attached to the email are two key letters. One letter is from an individual that owns a company called Excalibur Management Group. And it's addressed to Jay Russolo. Jay Russolo is the number two man at Disney, the number one man being Bob Iger. These are your one and two heavy hitters. It's like Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. They are the ones that bring in the money for Disney and make Disney go and make children laugh. They are the big cheaters. So the first letter is from the individual at Excalibur to Russell Lowe, And then the other letter is from Russell Lowe to the Excalibur manager. And what these letters had said is that the land has been bought and we're ready to move forward with the park and the announcement. And I'm going to get back to these letters later on because these are other red flags that I think maybe investors got a little greedy and didn't act on it. These letters were taken to an attorney here in Dallas who works for a very prestigious law firm. And they were shown to him. And Uncle Chip said, look, we're going to start buying land. We need to put joint ventures together. And the reason he went to this attorney, one, because he knew him. I think they were swimming partners at some club. But he knew this attorney had clients with deep pockets. That's how the first investment came in. It was a $7 million investment that was invested in the Salina 209 joint venture that bought property that was allegedly going to be at the front gate of where Disney proposed to build the theme park. So they're not speculating on land that Disney wants to purchase, but the land all around it where other developments and businesses might want to get the overflow of the of the Disney visitors. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, because that's, that's where all the money is probably going to be made. People are going to be building hotels and things around there, and that's where you're going to make all the money. So they invested in this. Now, the initial investment, there's two types of investment which was going to be important at trial. The initial investment, the investors were actually buying land and your investment was secured by that land you bought. Now, that land was never going to be at the value that you were paying for it, but at least you had a little security there. The bigger investments, which came toward the end, and the end being from 2006 to 2008 timeframe is when all the money came in. The bigger investments came with what were called options to purchase the land, okay? And what I mean by that is the investors would contract with the sellers of the land, the owners of the land, hey, we're going to buy your property for this amount on this date, okay? What they're doing is locking in a low price. So when the Disney announcement comes out, and just to to simplify this, I'm going to buy your property for $10 an acre at this price. 
Well, when the Disney announcement comes out and Disney says, we're building property here, that land is going to go up to $500 per acre, okay? So you just increased your fee exponentially. But that seller, because he entered this contract, has to sell you that land at $10 an acre, not the $500 an acre that it's going to be worth after Disney you know, makes their announcement. So everything is announcement driven. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So that, and so once so, these developers can purchase this land real cheap, they can turn right around once the announcement's been made and sell it at this extra, <laughs> extra, extra high price. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's what's conveyed to this attorney and his client. And the Lucas Company, they did an initial presentation. And the presentation was Lucas Jr. doing the presentation, telling them, I got this Disney inside source who's given me this information. And here's two of the documents that prove that. So that was the initial presentation. And this is where that non-disclosure agreement comes in, because, of course, they don't want everybody to get this information out to the rest of the public because then the land prices grow. But as far as we know, as investigators with looking at this from this time period, we know that it also aids in the scam because with a non-disclosure agreement, they can't tell other people what's going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and I've, I've had an investment case where I read in the non-disclosure agreement that you wouldn't tell anybody, included law enforcement. I mean, to me, that's a that's a red flag right there. Oh, absolutely. You know? That's what they call a clue. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So this initial $7 million that comes in, okay, Lucas now is the big cheese in the real estate company. They rehire him because he controls all the information. And that was his, that was his, his goal. That's why he would never give up the insider's name. I control this. So I can be the big man around the office and in town and whatnot. As part of these, of these real estate deals, the ones that actually bought property, the Lucas family got a 1% contractual interest in the property. So basically the investors are buying. Their investment goes to 99% ownership and 1% will come back to the Lucas real estate company. So that was one way they were making money. Another way is obviously they get the commission. Lucas took commissions. He was not licensed. So that obviously is against the law here in the state of Texas. He wasn't charged on that because we had bigger things to charge him with. But that was one of the things that we approached him with. In my book, I said, you know, Lucas now being the big cheese. He went, you know, there's the Disney Hercules movie, a song in it says he went from zero to hero in no time flat. That was Lucas. So I kind of uh, made the similarity there. The investors invested in this because at the presentation, Lucas said the announcement for Disney would be during a Thanksgiving football game between the Dallas Cowboys and the Washington Redskins. This was 2006, the 2006 Thanksgiving game. Well, at halftime and at the end of the game, there's no announcement. So now not only are the investors questioning the Lucas company, Uncle Chip and the father are questioning Tom. Hey, what happened? What happened with the announcement? Call your source. I got investors calling and, and wanting to know what went on. Lucas instantly responds. He goes, oh, my source said that was a soft date. The hard date announcement will happen at the 2007 Super Bowl during halftime. So Uncle Chip goes back to the attorney and tells him this, and they're good with it. In the meantime, they get a lot more investors to invest in other joint ventures. 2007 Super Bowl game finally rolls around. There's a big party at one of the investors' house. They have a Mickey Mouse cake. And at halftime, there's no announcement. Lucas Surprise! The, yeah, <laughs> Lucas had made the representation that you know they were going to do the old go to the winning quarterback and say, hey, what are you going to do after the Super Bowl? And the quarterback was supposed to respond, well, I'm going to Frontier Disney in Dallas, Texas. Well, that never happened at halftime. So Lucas goes to a bedroom in one of the investors' houses. He gets on his laptop and he creates a blog. So like I, I told you, this guy's a genius. He's quick to do things on the computer. He fraudulently makes up a blog he puts in all these typical things that making comments under different names so it looks legit. Well, somebody actually on that blog comes, you know, gets on it and says, 
I think you're the scammer. I think you're making this up, right? We actually got some of that text from the blog, but it was so blacked out we couldn't use it at trial. But, you know, I was able to decipher some of that. You know, you could pick out the words and, and say, this is what it said. Now, the uh, the prosecutors on the, on the case didn't feel comfortable enough using that as an exhibit, so we didn't introduce it at trial. This is a public blog? Yeah, yeah. And it, that he created. But it's the supposed spot. to be a top secret announcement. Clue number two, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, oh. yeah, there were so many red flags in this case, Jerry, that you do scratch your head. And, and I, you know, I used to have a partner that worked the mob in New York. He came down to Dallas and he once said that we had the only kind of job where you could laugh at the victim when you're doing white collar cases because you got to scratch your head and say, why would you do this? Wasn't this a clue to you? Didn't you see the red flag? You probably asked those questions hundreds of times, and it's always the same. Well, yeah. you know, I thought it was legitimate. I trusted them. I saw they wanted to it money. to be legitimate. They wanted yeah. to have this opportunity to make lots and lots of dollars. And it's hard to do, you know, but sometimes you have to say that in these type of cases, sometime the victim is operating from greed as much as the perpetrator. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that was a decision we were going to have to throw it out in this case later on, too. Anyway, getting back to the Super Bowl, the announcement is not made after the game. So again, all the investors and Uncle Chip, they're all coming back to Tom and saying, hey, what is the deal? And Tom says, well, I just talked to my source and he said there's a problem with some of the deeds, some of the titles on the deeds. So Disney decided not to make the announcement. Going back to those two letters that they were using at the presentation, one of the letters said all the property they needed had been secured. Okay, so now now what Thomas Lucas Jr. is saying is inconsistent to what was stated in this letter. And the attorney who invested in this, the initial investor, questioned them on that and said, hey, I invested in this land because you represented that all the land had been secured. So why is this happening? Uncle Chip made up some excuse and saying, well, the Disney insider is saying this, this, or this, which I was never clear on, but the attorney bought off on it and said, okay, we'll wait till the next announcement. The next announcement date was going to be the Super Bowl 2008. Wow, a yeah. year later. A year later, right? Lucas had just bought himself a year. But what he bought himself more than that was the umpteen hundreds of investors and millions of dollars that they were going to collect over that year. That's the time frame that he just bought for the company. Right after the Super Bowl, our first professional athlete invested in this company. It was a uh, professional basketball player, big guy, used to play for SMU. I knew of him well. I did not know the man until I met him and interviewed him. He was a local sports celebrity, and he invested his first half a million dollars in the company. He would go on to invest over $3 million and lose it all. But he was one of the initial investors right after the uh, 2007 Super Bowl. Now, he attended multiple presentations, just like all the investors did. And by this time, it was Lucas, Uncle Chip, and another man named Emerson who were doing the presentations. Emerson used to swim for SMU, and he was a good, you know, he swam at the time in the 1980s with the uh, basketball player. So they knew each other well from SMU Athletics. And that's one of the reasons why the NBA player got involved with investing. The other thing is, you know, there may have been a touch of greed there. You know, what was presented at the presentation were those two letters, the Walt Disney Orlando, Florida history of how the land inflates in value. But Lucas also knew he had to come up with two more documents at least. And these two more documents were huge. The first one, was a preliminary concept plan of what Frontier Disney would look like. And what this piece of paper looked like, it was very, very artsy. I mean, a professional could have done it. An art design professional could have done it. It's a floor plan of the park 
on one side of the of the eight by eleven paper, and on the other side is a photo of Frontier Disney logo, and then it's a photo of Main Street with a couple of kids walking down Main Street. You can see a covered wagon in the background. Looks very legit. That was one of the documents. And again, that's going to come into a big play when we get into the investigation part. The other document was Jay Russolo, the number two man at Disney, allegedly rehearsing a speech at the Majestic Theater in Dallas, Texas. The Majestic Theater is a nostalgic theater that's used for various various things. Now it's no longer a theater district, so it's used for performances and things like that. But it's Jay Russolo, and above Russolo on the stage is a big screen TV, if you will, and it has Frontier Disney coming to Dallas. And he's allegedly rehearsing the announcement. And this is the number two man at Disney. That's correct. So now we got at least two legitimate documents, or they look legitimate, and then these two letters. These are being sold at the presentation. I got my insider. He's in my pocket. He's giving me info. This is some of the information he's given me. So investors are invested right and left here. I don't think it was very difficult for them to get money. They went up to uh, Indianapolis. They did a presentation to the Indianapolis Colts. From my investigation, I couldn't determine any players from the team investment. But I know the presentation was done. They also got involved a National Football League player who was not only a national champion in college, but he was a world champion in professional sports. He's a big name, and he lost several million dollars, too. I think the audience here probably could figure out from my book who these two players were. But when I talked to them, they both asked me not to use their real names, so I did, and I kind of switched it around a little bit. But if you're an investigator, and I call these people that listen to your show, they probably can't find out who they are with a little little detective work. All these investors are invested now, and 2008 rolls around. Here's the Super Bowl again. The same presentation is being made up. The quarterback's going to be interviewed at halftime, and at the end of the game, the winning quarterback's going to say he's going to Frontier Disney. Two years this game has been going on now. Yep. Lo and behold, it doesn't happen, right? Investors are going through the Surprise! roof. What's going? Yeah, what's going on, you know? So Lucas has to come up with more documents to show these people that Disney's really coming. So he creates a lease agreement. On the preliminary concept plan, Disney's going to have everything that Walt Disney has. It's going to have an airport by Southwest Airlines built up there. It's going to have all these high-end retail shops, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, you know, even Nordstrom's going to be there, okay? Polo, all these companies. He makes up lease agreements between Disney and these retail centers, and he produces those at the presentation. He comes up with the final concept plan for Frontier Disney. He gives that to the investors. He comes up with Texcop. Excot being the play on Epcot, okay? So that's what they're going to call it here in Texas. He gives them a art design of what Texcot's going to look like. He produces a ride at Frontier Disney, Pirates of the Caribbean, but he also has some Texas rides like Texas, Thunder, Mountain, Houston, we have a problem. Frontier Land, Davy Crockett Shooting Arcade. That in an art design of where these rides are going to be. He produces, again, a an art design photo of where all the shops at Disney are going to be. He produces a Texas Animal Frontier where all the animals will be running in North Texas. So now all the investors are put at ease. But here's the big thing. Now they got to ante up more money for their options because these option contracts expire. They have a certain day, and the day is always tied to the announcement date. So if the announcement's not made, all these investors will lose their money if they don't re-up the contract. So they got to come in, sign a new contract, ante up more money, and extend the contract until the next contract date. Well, the next contract date is now going to be July 4th, 2008. They're going to make the announcement on this day. All the, all the investors put in, you know, hundreds of thousands of more to secure their contract and more investors are coming in during this time. 
Well, July 2008 rolls around. And lo and behold, there's no announcement, right? Investors are starting to pound fists on the table, and they want to know what's going on. And Lucas, again, says, hey, I talked to my source. My Disney source says it's now going to be moved to the Olympics. The Olympics were going to be played in August of 2008 in Beijing, China. You know, what's so crazy about this is that Disney is big enough itself not to need the backdrop of a Super Bowl or an Olympics to make this huge announcement. It's going to be covered by the media regardless. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why all these investors are seeing green, okay? Obviously. you're absolutely right. Yeah, you made a comment in the book about this is no longer investing. Yeah, it's kind of like gambling. Yeah, I thought that was excellent. It's no longer investing, but now it's gambling. They're just trying to save their bet. Yep. And and by this time, I think you or me, you know, hopefully we would have done our due diligence before, but by this time, we're going to be doing some kind of due diligence. Hey, is this real? Is this legit? But how do you do, I I mean, he, he came up with the perfect scheme because how do you do due diligence on a project that is supposed to be top secret and that you have been made to sign a non-disclosure agreement. I mean, how do you do due diligence in that situation? Well, I mean, I probably would have picked up the phone and called this, you know, because here's the deal, Jerry. What If I make that phone call as an investor, what's Disney going to do is, oh, the cat's out of the bag. We better not announce we're going to open Disney. No, they've already supposedly put in too much money in that. You're really not going to kill anything Disney's got. You're just trying to confirm something. You know, I would go up there and talk to the landowner. Why are you selling this land? Well, because they offered me a lot of money for it. Here's something that I did not know, but my wife, who's a banker, knew. She said the Disney rumor has been going on for over 20 years at the time, 2005. She said that's that's a 20-year-old rumor. That probably would have been on the internet had you searched. Wow. Rumor of Disney. Mm-hmm. Not real. You know, mm-hmm. something like that. And, you know, you're right. Because, of course, if it was real, Disney would deny it. But if Disney heard all of these investors had put this money into it and it wasn't real, Disney would come forward and say, hey, wait a minute. This is a scam. And so you're right. They had nothing to lose by calling Disney and letting them know what was going on. Yeah. Or, Jerry, the land that Disney was supposedly buying, how hard it would it be to go identify that land, go up to the deed records at the county courthouse, and find out who the owner is? It could be up on one of these made-up names, but then you look up these made-up names. It's not hard to find whether a company is a shell company or not. At least it's not hard for me. Uh, I- maybe for an investor, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, and I guess also you could see if there had been any recent transactions, real estate transactions. If you go and you see that this land that you're told that Disney just bought, and you can see, oh, no, that's been the same owner for the last 40, 50 years, then you know, wait a minute, this land hasn't been recently purchased by anyone, even if it was a fictitious company. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, there was a lot of things they could have done, but they were relying on the presentations, which is, you know, one of the things in white collar crime we, we, you know, we bring to uh, the United States Attorney's Office is what representations were made and what did the victims rely on? Why don't you talk a little bit about what makes something a bad business deal and what makes it a fraud and a crime? Okay. Yeah. So. Here, here's here's my personal opinion, and I've given presentations to corporations and stuff on, on ethics and, and, and stuff before. And to me, it's very black and white, Jerry. If you got to lie, steal, and cheat to do something, you're doing something unethical, okay? there's To me, there's no argument against that. If you're lying, stealing, and cheating to make a buck, you're doing something unethical. If you're lying, stealing, and cheating, and you're using... The U.S. mail or interstate wires or the computer, then you're probably committing a criminal act. So all it takes 
is for an investor to part with his money, rely on the information that you gave him, and prove that the information is fraudulent. That, that's your crime right there. White collar, I mean, to me, it's not that difficult. A lot of it is black and white. There may be some gray areas in some places, but represent something that's not true, get money for it, and using the interstate wires, to me, that's a no-brainer. And, and we're going to get to that. You know, you probably read it in the book, but we're going to get to that, too, where the, I think the FBI in Dallas dropped the ball on this. Yeah. Now, where uh, were you again? Because you were in Dallas, but you were at a resident okay. agency. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, a little background on me. So I got assigned to the Dallas office in 1991, and I spent my whole career in Dallas, but I only spent four years in the Dallas headquarters office. Now, all headquarters, all field offices have what's called uh, resident agencies, as you know, and one of the resident agencies in Dallas was a place up in Plano, and it eventually moved to Frisco, and I was there for 21 years. So the difference being the Frisco office most worked mostly in the Eastern District of Texas. The Dallas office only worked in the Northern District of Texas. So what that means is where you're going to prosecute a case, whether it's going to be in the Eastern District or the Northern District matters on where the crime was committed, the overt act was committed. So that was the difference. I worked in a very small office at the time I got there. It ended up becoming three squads by the time I left. Yeah, and for everyone listening, the distinction between what the Dallas office did and what you did in the Frisco RA, this will all make sense as as right. we as as you continue the the case review. Yeah, and we're almost there. So so here here's the deal. July eighth, there's no announcement. Okay. All the investors gotta re up their option, put in more money. You know, the basketball player, the NBA players that, you know, when I interviewed him, he goes, Rick, in for a penny, in for a pound. I had put so much money in this already. I couldn't just walk away with it. I just had to pull a couple of more hundred in there. Okay. This guy was actually borrowing for banks at this point. So not only did he lose his investment, he was stuck with loans that he had to pay. So it, it pretty much crippled some of these investors. Some of them, you know, retirees had to go back to work because they spent their retirement funds on this. It was very tragic for the victims of this matter. After July 4th, all the investors put in more money. Well, Lucas had to bring more documents from his insider. This time, he brought all the lodges, the hotels that were going to be built on the park site, just like in Orlando. And he called this the Grand Texan Adventure Hotel. And he quoted, unquoted, there will be 1,215 luxury hotel rooms. That's going to mean something in the investigation. It didn't mean anything to the investors because they, you know, they're sitting there thinking, oh man, that's a lot of rooms. Great. He produces that. He produces all kinds of photos of this hotel, interior and exterior, up to the lake outside, the swimming pool between the high rises, the interior lobbies with people sitting by lamps on couches, having a drink at the bar, all these pictures. So very elaborate. Beijing games roll around. Guess what? No announcement. This, really? Yeah. <laughs> at this point, at least three of the investors I had personally talked to, and I talked to a lot, but three particular ones, they were beating their fist. One of them approached Lucas and Chip and the father and said, you know, if you're lying to me, I'm going to burn your... And he was very flamboyant with his language. So, I mean, he pretty much threatened them physically and legally. They told him, hey, it's all true. And after they put in more money to renew the option contract, Lucas produces advertisement for Frontier Disney. One such advertisement was this outer space photo of the Earth. And at various points, they got Disney castles on them. One being in California, one being in Florida, one being in Hong Kong and one being in Texas. The advertisement has said Disney coming to North Texas the summer of 2011. Another advertisement was the Dallas skyline. And part of the Dallas skyline, there's this building called Reunion Tower. Reunion Tower is this silo-shaped building. 
And at the top, it used to have a restaurant in it. The sphere slowly rotated while you dined there. So you get a full view of the Dallas area. What he did, he superimposed two smaller spheres on top of the big sphere. So it looked like mouth ears. And the announcement is a magical mouse comes to Big D summer of 2011. And then one of my favorites is when you enter one of the states, you know, there's always a sign, welcome to wherever you're at. In this case, welcome to Texas. This had a welcome to Texas sign. At the bottom of the sign, it says Frontier Disney DFW. And beside the sign is Mickey and Minnie in cowboy gear doing a dance. And it says, Mickey and the gang arrive in Lone Star State, summer of 2011. All of this looked legit to the investors. So naturally, they're going to throw more money at this to extend the contract. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's just yep. unbelievable that they're still believing in this guy. They're still believing it. October was, uh, 2008 was the next announcement date. In October of eight, the market had a severe crash, the Dow Jones. So Lucas tells the investors, well, the announcement is not made because the market crashed. Now, I ask you, what does that got to do with an announcement? I don't know. To me, it doesn't have anything to do with an announcement. So the announcement's pushed to November of 8, and still no announcement is made. By this time, two of the investors are starting to do their due diligence. None of the presentation documents were allowed to leave with the investors. So while Lucas went out and had a smoke one time during a presentation, one of the investors took a picture on his cell phone of those two letters. And then he took a picture of Jay Russo giving his alleged practice presentation at the Majestic Theater. And then he also took a picture of the preliminary concept plan. And these all came out a bit blurry, the letters more than the photos, but you were still able to make out what it read. So as part of their investigation and part of mine, both of us ended up going through those two letters and writing it out exactly what was said. And to me, as an investor, it had to be horrifying to read what you were going to read. The letter was so poorly written. Words were misspelled. Things were said in a letter that just wouldn't be said between professionals, especially executives at Disney. Some of these items were like Jay Russo telling Excalibur management, hey, the person who's going to run Frontier Disney is this guy named Holtz. First of all, Jay Russo allegedly misspelled Holtz's name. That's his own employee. Second of all, what kind of company tells another company that I'm going to put this man in charge before telling that man he's actually going to be in charge? That doesn't happen in, in, in the corporate world. Some of the terminology used in this were the King Ranch Project. That was the code name for Frontier Disney initially. If you looked at the history of Disney, Walt Disney called Disney World, before it was announced, Project S. I deduce that Lucas knew to use the word project. I mean, who knows to use King Ranch Project like Project S in, in Disney World. Another thing, King Ranch is probably the largest or the second largest ranch in the state of Texas. Texans know that. People in California don't know that, probably. So the fact that you're telling the investors or referring to this as the King Ranch Project told me as an investigator, somebody in Texas wrote this. The way the letter was so poorly written, it also told me somebody immature wrote this. So it was not hard to believe that Lucas was the mastermind when the investors came to me with this case. The biggest thing in both these letters, it referenced tracts of land. Tracts is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. Lucas, in his letters, spelled it T-R-A-C-K-S. That was huge to me, that these letters were bogus. You knew they were bogus, but as an FBI agent, you got to go talk to everybody to let them tell you it's bogus because I can't testify in trial saying this letter's bogus because of this. I need the author of the letter to testify at trial to say this is bogus because I never wrote this and I wouldn't use language like this, those kind of things. So as an investor, these guys, they are mad. It's the NBA player and another guy who came to me named Nikki Stone. They were tell about this. They wanted blood. 
they did not come to me until after two. Actually, I had to seek them out. So they never actually came to me. So here's the deal. In November 2008, Lucas tells all the investors that Jay Russolo was in town to make the announcement here in Dallas, but his wife and daughter got in a severe car crash in California, and he had to fly back. So the NBA player and Vicky Stone wanted to confirm that. They called Mount Sinai Hospital in uh, L.A., and they say, can you put me through to the room, Jay Russolo's daughter? They had her name. I forgot her name. Will you put me through her room? So the operator at the hospital says, yes, one moment, and she transfers them. They hang up the phone because to them that was good enough. Now, we've called enough hospitals, whether it's personal or through through our job as FBI agents, that operator didn't transfer them to the room. That operator probably transferred them to reception. Because they were never checked in to Mount Sinai Hospital. They never had a car accident. All of that came out at trial. Or when myself and the assistant United States attorney went to Disney to interview Jay Russo, that came out there too. So these investors desperately wanted this to be true. Even transferring a call gave them a little tiny bit of hope that this yes. was true, and they grabbed on it. Yes. And I think, you know, I, I ended up asking them, why did you not wait for the line to connect to the room? And they go, man, I don't know. We, I guess we wanted it to be true. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Jerry. So anyway, one of the other things that he said to try to calm the uh, fears of the investors, he said he was at the mall, mall in a high-end part of Dallas, and he ran into an old high school friend who was, at the time, one of our big anchors on the evening news. And he asked her about, hey, what do you know about this rumor that Disney's coming to town? And she told him that rumor has been around 20 years. It's not going to happen. He goes back and tells the investors, I met up with an anchor of Dallas Morning News, and she confirmed she went to the meeting where Jay Russo was at so they could plan the announcement. So he told the investors that. The investors believed it, hook, line, and sinker. You know, two weeks later, Lucas comes out and says there is no deal. And the investors go crazy. After all this time of insisting there was a deal, what made him come out finally and say there's no deal? He said the insider told him that because of the way the economy was going, Disney was going to hold off on the theme park. Okay. okay. And because it was a period of time where the economy was really bad, it's possible. They believed it. Yeah, they believed it. Okay. And at that point, but he got approached by the NBA player and Nikki Stone. What these two individuals did, they started Googling that picture, that photo of Jay Russo on the stage in the Majestic Theater. And what they found was the identical photo of Jay Russo on the stage at Madison Square Garden for Disney's 50th anniversary. The exact same photo. The only difference was was the logo at the top of the photo. One said Frontier Disney. The other said Disney's 50th anniversary. He just took this off the internet and superimposed his own logo. But it looked legit. Now, this played well at trial later on because we had both those pictures up side by side. The other thing they found on the Internet was just as shocking to them. They Googled a Frontier Disney, that preliminary concept plan. And what they ended up finding was a park in Kansas called Wild West World. The exact same preliminary concept plan down to the kids standing in the street by the covered wagon. The only difference being is one said Frontier Disney and one said Wild West World. The architect on both of them was even printed on both pages. It was a company out of Kansas City called Law Kingdom. Kingdom. K-I-N-G-D-O-N. So they were on there. You know, obviously for us, that gives us the lead. Go talk to them and, and see if this architect did this concept plan. This all started 2005. We're up into 2008, going into 2009. By this time, investor money obviously had ceased. In 2012, 
we get what's called a walk-in. Now, for the audience, a walk-in is somebody that comes off the street to make a complaint to the FBI. They don't have an appointment. You know, they don't pick up the phone and call. They just come knock on our door. And back in these days, we used to let them in and we talk to them. That doesn't happen anymore, I don't think. Anyway, it's a doctor who had invested in this and lost $3 million. He's coming there, and he's talking to me and another guy, another friend of mine, agent named John Skillstead, and we're interviewing him. And you can see this guy is beat down. I mean, he, you know, I Googled him. He was a well-known surgeon, good career as a doctor, and he is beat down. And he goes, now I need somebody involved. I don't have the money to sue these people anymore. None of the investors do because they invested all their money in this. So nobody, there were a couple of lawsuits. They didn't get very far because the investors ran out of money. So he's almost begging us to open this case. And we're going through this. And he tells us that he and other investors have been down to the Dallas FBI and have, have complained about this case to the economic crime squad. And the two times that I knew of, one time the economic crime squad told them this was a civil matter and it wasn't criminal. The second time is, well, if you got a lawsuit going, what we'll do is wait until the lawsuit's over and then we'll decide whether we're going to work it or not. So when he's telling, us, telling me this, I'm thinking a couple of things. I'm thinking, first of all, what kind of agent tells somebody we're going to wait till the lawsuit's over? The lawsuit could take four or five years. That means you're going to run the statute of limitations on the criminal part. A investment fraud scam from the last overt act that's committed by the bad guy, you got five years to indict that guy. If we had waited for the lawsuit, that would have run the entire statute of limitations. That just made me scratch my head. The second one that made me scratch my head is why an agent would say this is a civil matter. First of all, we had. This one guy lost over $3 million. That met the criminal threshold of taking this to the United States Attorney's Office. Two, you had the brand name of Disney involved. That's jury appeal right there. Three, he told us about the professional athletes that had been victims. That's more jury appeal. Four, you had the illegal use of mail and wires that gave you your criminal misconduct. I'm thinking to myself, why would anyone say this is a civil matter? So, you know, after the interview, I looked at Skilly and I said, this case could be big. I called an AUSA, a good friend of mine, Shamoral Ship Chandler, and said, I want you on board to prosecute this if we can find the evidence that says somebody is guilty of this. You know, he, he knew my work. He, he immediately agreed that he'd be the AUSA. So we ran with this. This, this was the start of the investigation in 2012. I would have loved to have worked a case like this. I mean, this is exactly you know what you're saying. If they had just gone into a business deal with him and, and did these options and purchased this land, and it was real, Disney actually was initially going to put a theme park in the Plano area, then it's just a bad business deal, a business deal that just you know didn't happen. But the fact that it wasn't true, that this whole investment was based on deceptions and lies, is the perfect case. I would have loved somebody walk into the Philadelphia office and hand this thing over to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when this guy told me about the, the two photos that the other investors had found on the Internet that were transposed, I'm thinking, okay. I thought I had enough at that time that we could have not only indicted Lucas, but convicted him just on that information, that interview, that $3 million law, those two fake photos and those two fake letters. To me, that was enough. But, you know, like agents, we, you know, we want to make sure that the case is won before we get to trial. So we did the investigation on it. And the investigation was challenging at time. It was fun. It, you know, it tested your abilities on being an investigator, which I love. My background is 25 years I worked white collar crime, but 11 of those years I was also on the SWAT team. So I got to work violent crime. And in an RA, the small office of the FBI, we only had one violent crime agent to work all the violent crimes of a four county area. 
So I was always the guy that went out with him. That was John Skillfish. I always went out with him to help him with his work when he needed backup. So I got the experience of white collar and violent crime. And during the FBI, after the FBI, in my current job as a private investigator, I've been always asked what cases are more challenging, violent crime or white collar. And it's hands down. White collar is always the most challenging type of case. And the reason being, violent crime, anytime you're talking to the subject, you're always going to be the smartest guy in that room. White collar, for me at least, I'm rarely the smartest guy in that room. So, you know, you, you got a formidable opponent on the other side of the table. Yeah. Uh, and, an, uh, and another point, since, you know, I worked the matter too, is that on a violent crime, you know what the crime is. It's a crime, yeah. you know. When it comes to white collar, sometimes you don't even know what you're looking at if it is a crime. And so you've got to to investigate and prove that in addition to who did the crime. Yeah, that's a great point, Jerry. Absolutely. So anyway, after after I get the USA on board, so now it's time for the investigation. And, And like we know in white collar crime, what's the first step you do? You follow the money. So, you know, you know, I, I initially tried to go out and do some interviews and almost, I wouldn't have blown the case, but almost made the case a lot more difficult than it had to be. You know, we went straight at Emerson. Emerson worked for the real estate company. He was at the presentation. So myself and Daryl James went out there to try to talk to him. And he kind of upset me right off the bat. You know, we beat on his door for a little while. Guy wouldn't answer. He wouldn't do anything. So we get back in the car because it was hot wanted to be in air condition and we started running tags around his uh, apartment and found a car. We actually found two cars that were registered to him. So we knew he was probably there. So we come back and now I'm a little upset. So I'm beating on the door this time and he comes and answers the door. And, you know, and this time I yelled out, you know, Emerson, it's FBI, open the door. And this time he opens the door and he goes, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you guys. I was in the shower. I said, yeah, whatever, dude, your hair's not wet. You don't look like you just took a shower. But he agreed to talk to us initially. And we were going at him like he was going to be a subject. Because one of the things that we had in evidence was an email from Uncle Chip to a real estate developer in the area. And it was titled Fake Disney. And then it was a long article about a Disney that was going to be put in Hawaii. Emerson was copied on that email. So we're going at him thinking he's a bad guy. And he tells us in the interview, man, that was written as a joke. So as an FBI agent, Jerry, you know what's happened. And you see this email that says fake Disney. It was hard to believe it was a joke. Long story short, it was a joke. But at the time, we didn't know that. So we're going at this guy telling him, you know, he's starting to back paddle and, and say, I think it's time I call an attorney. And we tell him, yeah, you're going to need one because, you know, you're probably going to get arrested down the road. As we're walking out, he says something that we had to stop and think about and talk about. He said, yeah, me and my family lost everything on this. He actually invested in this because he thought the rumors were true. Wow. Okay. So obviously, if you're a con man, you don't invest in the con scheme and lose years and your family's money. So I I told him, I said, look, since you already invoked your right as an attorney, get your attorney to call me and we'll set something up and talk about this. So he did. He was great help coming from the inside of what was happening. And he had invested? Yes, he lost. He lost everything. He was going through a divorce, fighting for custody of a child. He had no money. And in the end, I started feeling for the guy. So, you know, we told his attorney, look, we don't think he's a subject. We came at him hard thinking that. We think he's a witness. Please talk to us. And the attorney allowed him to talk to us. He was a lot of help. Like I said, he was at the presentation. He told us who was making the presentation. He told us who was getting the documents and presenting them. He told us how it was being done. He told us how Lucas had changed stories about the the, uh, Disney Insider from a high school friend to an old friend to somebody who worked at Excalibur Management, the shell company, supposedly buying the land for Disney. So his story kept changing all the time. And that was that was helpful to us. 
Another couple of things is during the lawsuit, Lucas had been deposed two times, and that was astronomical to our investigation because he has already admitted the stuff. Basically, he lied through both depositions. So now I could prove everything that happened, and I had his lies in the deposition. So as we know as, as agents, we get to trial. Lucas is either going to have to defend whether he was lying at the civil trial or whether he was lying in the criminal trial. One of them's a lie because they were inconsistent stories. So anyway, I'm following the money. We subpoena the bank accounts. We get all the investors' names. And this is great because it's also giving us our count. You can see where checks came in or where wires came in. And if the wires came in from out-of-state investors, you know, obviously it's going to be wire fraud. And if the checks came in, then more than likely they were mailed. So either way, we're going to have mail fraud or wire fraud. Other things we were trying to do is identify how the money was used, you know, and it was going to the sellers of these lands. These sellers cleaned up out there, you know, and a bunch of them, it's just a bunch of old farmers out there, you know, or some, you know, some land development companies were out there too, but most of them were like just people who've been working the land from family to family, generation to generation. So we, we started looking at events. We started interviewing people. My big thing is I wanted to identify the alleged source at Disney. So I finally tracked down that G-Man. G-Man was a guy named Garrett Singleton. Garrett Singleton worked for EMG. He was not the manager on the letters of EMG, Excalibur Management Group. That was a different person. G-Man, the insider source also changed from G-Man to a guy named Tyson and then a guy named Chris. Tyson and Chris both worked at Excalibur Management Group. So what Lucas was doing was he made up this shell company to allegedly buy land for Disney. He got on EMG's website. And, you know, when you get on a company website, you can see who the people are, the members of the company. He just took the names off this website. He did not know any of these people other than Garrett Singleton, who he met at the bachelor party. Does Excalibur have anything to do with real estate? No, absolutely not. Excalibur is a company that goes in and buys problem companies and then sells off the parts. They're, what do you call it, hedge funds, equity investors. That's what they do. They don't do anything in real estate. So, you know, obviously he picked the wrong company. The Disney source then changed to, quote unquote, Jennifer, quote unquote, Sarah, who were allegedly the executive assistants for Bob Iger and Jay Russo at Disney. You know, myself and, uh, and, you know, by this time, late in the game, Shamal had retired and moved on to private practice. So I got a new assistant U.S. attorney who was Chris Ethan, and he and I took a couple of trips out to Disney. But the main trip was to go interview the executive, interview Bob Iger, interview Jay Russo. And that in itself was an adventure for us, kind of became comical for us. But anyway, the executive assistants, they weren't named Jennifer and Sarah. So he just made up these names. When he concocted Disney memos or letters, he used the wrong zip code on Disney. So the executive assistants were able to point that out. They were able to give me legitimate documents that showed the differences in what Lucas was concocting and what official Disney documents looked like. So they were a big help. They both testified at trial, too. But the biggest help was Jay Russo, obviously. We needed somebody from Disney and what better guy than the number two or the number one guy to get up on the stand and say, hey, not only are we not coming to Texas, we wouldn't come to Texas because what economic sense would that make? We'd be taking business away from California and Orlando. We want people going to California and Orlando. If you put up a park in Texas, we're going to lose customers and who the heck wants to go to a park where it gets up to 115 in the summer? These were his reasons, and, and they were all good reasons. What was comical is most places as agents, we can walk in, knock on the door, flash our badge, and we gain access to it. You think about all the places that you're from in Philly that you were able to do that. Well, you know, there's places that you can't do that to, and Disney is one of them. So we know that a lot of security for major corporations or former FBI agents, or former federal agents. So we pick up the phone, and lo and behold, there is a former FBI agent who's running their security. 
he puts us in touch with the right people, the attorney, and we make the arrangements to go to Disney. So Chris and I fly out there. It's a three-hour flight, but we gain a couple hours for time change. But we get out there. We drive up to Burbank, California. We come to the big gates of Disney, which were impressive. You know, they have our parking place already for us. So we park. And as we're walking from the parking spot to the front office, which was just across the street, we're noticing how everybody at Disney is dressed very casually and they all have smiles on their faces. And, and I tell Chris, man, this has got to be a great place to work. Everybody's happy. Everybody's casual. And he and I are sitting there starting to sweat in our coats and ties. And we're greeted by a couple of attorneys, one a uh, chief counsel and one outside counsel for Disney. And they take us up to a room to meet two more attorneys. So, you know, they're sitting there trying to dictate, you know, what we can and what we can't not talk about. And we, you know, we're staying quiet, listening to them. Then when it's finally time to talk to Jay Ruslow, who we had scheduled first, they say, all right, we're ready for you. Come on in. You got five minutes. Five and minutes? I, <laughs> five minutes. To know Jay Ruslow's and bye bye your schedule. Jerry, they are more busy than the president of the United States. They each have three executive assistants, you know, 24 hours a day, manning their phone calls and, and emails and things like that. These guys are busy individuals, but we're FBI agents and an assistant United States attorney. <laughs> we don't take our orders from anybody, right? We go into the room. Chris sits down, opens up uh, his auditor bag and pulls out two big binders. And he goes, this will not be done in five minutes. And he goes... If that's going to be a problem, Agent Velasquez will pull that subpoena out of his pocket and give it to uh, Jay. We can do this all back in Texas at our convenience and obviously not his. And these attorneys' eyes just drop. You know, now they've arranged all this. They probably told Jay it's only going to take five minutes. Well, Jay pops right up and goes, ah, that's fine. Let's do whatever we have to. The guy couldn't have been more friendly, more cordial. I think he liked meeting people from the government. He was happy to help Disney. Other than these attorneys, and I know they were just doing their job, so I'm not trying to badmouth them, but it, it was comical to see the expressions on their face when Chris told them that. Why they would think it would take five minutes. <laughs> uh, they, they absolutely knew nothing about criminal law, Jerry. They actually said at one point when uh, they came down for the trial, oh, yeah, we get it in any kind of a, a corporate secrets. One of us will stand up and eject. And I looked at Chris. Chris looked at me and goes, you can't eject from the audience. No, you out of the courtroom. So, yeah, they do nothing about criminal law. But anyway, getting back to the subpoena, I'm glad they didn't call us on our bluff because I didn't have a subpoena. Just a great idea on Chris's part. But uh, like I said, Jay Ruslow gave us everything we needed, denied everything, told us when it's time, just call his attorneys there, and, and he'd come down and testify. And so that was a big adventure. And he was so thorough, so good on his interview and his testimony that we didn't even have to go talk to Bob Iger, which was. I don't know. I guess could have been a little disappointing for me, but yeah, I understand he's busy. And, and like we said, we weren't going to need him at trial then after, after Jay said everything he said. Getting back to trying to identify the, the individuals who Lucas said were the insider. We had, we had tossed out everybody he said except two. And where we got this information, we actually interviewed Lucas on two occasions. The first time, AUSA Shamoil Ship Chandler was there with me for the second time. Chris Heason was with me. But the first time we're sitting there and we tell, we tell the defense attorney, look, this is his opportunity to tell us his side of the story. We have a story from all the victims. Okay. And it's all consistent. We had the deposition that were taken from the victim and from Lucas. So we want to know two things, his side of the story. And we want to know who the Disney source is. And initially, he told us, well, I don't want to tell you who the Disney source is. I said, that's the purpose of this meeting. You know, you're not going to tell us that. We can end the meeting. Lucas leans over, talks to his attorney, whispers something. Attorney shakes his head. And then Lucas pulls out a picture and sides it over to me. And it was obviously a picture taken from his cell phone. And it's an old, bald guy that he identifies and says, this is my Disney source. And uh, he goes, the guy died in January. I forgot the year. He said the guy, you know, the guy's name is Paul Johnson, and he died. And Convenient. I, I, 
Yeah, and I look at Shamal, and I look back at his attorney. I go, really? You're going to give us the name of a dead guy? And I wanted to end the meeting right there because I was so upset with him. You know, because one of the questions I asked him, I said, look, you're going to get indicted tomorrow, probably. You've gone and spent a lot of money on legal representation going through these civil lawsuits. And all you had to do was just give up the name of your Disney source. Why would you put yourself and your family through all this and y'all's family finances through all of this when it was unnecessary? And his response was, well, when I give my word to somebody, I keep my word. And I'm thinking, okay, that's about the dumbest thing I ever heard when you're facing jail. Shmuel and I said, all right, let's just talk about it. And and it was good because we knew everything he was going to say was a lie. Our interview was under a what's called the proffer agreement. And for the audience, a proffer agreement, basically the criminal could come in and tell us everything truthfully and nothing could be used against him in court, except if he lies. If he lies, then we can use everything he says in court. That's the agreement. He comes in and everything he told us was a lie. I mean, he just told us how he met Paul Johnson at the bachelor party and Paul Johnson worked for Disney. He goes through the whole story. and So I told him at the end of the interview, I think he was full of crap and he was getting indicted tomorrow. And then I escorted him out of the office and we talked to his attorney for a little while. We told his attorney, I said, look, all your all your client did was make our job a little harder. But, you know, this is what we do. And what I meant by that now is that I have to go back to all the people I interviewed at the bachelor party, go back and re-interview them again and show them the picture of Paul Johnson and see if he was there. Obviously, every one of them says, no, there was no old man at the party and nobody was talking about Disney because we were all sitting around drinking, looking at nude women. He said, who's going to talk business? And that was the story for 10 of the 15 people that were at the bachelor party. OK, I didn't interview five of them because we had what we needed. But I think Lucas gave us the name of a dead man because he did not think we could find him. And I'll tell you what, you know. People can badmouth the FBI all they want, but I tell you something about the FBI. If you tell them to go find somebody, they're going to find them. Our resources are just so good. The contacts that agents have are just so good in other agencies that, you know, we're going to find who we're looking for. Yeah, you know, I always scratch my head and kidding with the other agents. How do we have 10 most wanted? How can we not find people? Anyway, Paul Johnson, I went back and sat down with our analyst, Michelle Miller and told her, this is what I got. This guy, his name is Paul Johnson. He came from Louisiana during the Katrina evacuation. He ended up staying here. So he's probably got Louisiana ties, and he's supposed to be living in Frisco, Texas somewhere. That's all I gave her. She came back to me the next day, gave me a list of about 10 individuals, and said, it's got to be one of these people. I went and knocked on all 10 doors. Lo and behold, the last door I knock on, I find a a uh, Cajun woman, she's probably in her late 50s, couldn't have been nicer, Cajun accent. We talked about Paul. I allowed her to tell me everything she loved about him, which I think she appreciated. You know, it's that thing that we do that as agents, you build a rapport so they trust you. Another thing she said, too, you know, she didn't want her name used, so I made up a name for her. I respected that. She knew Tom. And she goes, they met in a methadone clinic. You know, the only relationship they have is sometimes Paul would pick up Tom on the way to the clinic, and that was it. She goes, Tom is nothing but a liar. That's how Paul described it, always exaggerating and making up things. So even she knew that and didn't even grow up with the guy. She goes, Paul never worked for Disney. He used to be a milkman down in Louisiana. Then he was a used car salesman. Then he was something like a janitor or something. Never worked for Disney. She kept his phone. Paul, unfortunately, committed suicide. So she still had his wallet. She still had his cell phone as a memory thing. And we went through the cell phone, charged it up and went through it, looked at his contacts. Lucas was in there, but there were only like four contacts. Okay. And none of them worked for Disney. Went through his wallet. No business card of Disney. No ID of Disney. She said he didn't have a passport. One of the things that Lucas had said is that the Disney source showed him a pay stub and gave him a business card from Disney that helped convince some of the investors. So Paul Johnson didn't have the business card, but let's go back to the pay stub. Here's another clue. 
we're talking 2005, Jerry. Now, when I came into the bureau, you know, my, you know, I went through Quantico in 1990, the academy, and in '91 I was assigned to Dallas. I was one of the few agents still getting a paycheck. Being a white collar geek, I, I loved having that hard check in my hand. I didn't trust, the, the, you know, technology that the check would get into my bank account. So I held out for that check until the bureau finally forced us to electronically deposit our checks, right? That was way before 2005. Now, the Bureau, as I talked about our computer system earlier, we're behind everybody in technology except for the guys up in D.C., right? So do you actually think Disney pays their employees with a hard check? No, <laughs> there are no check stubs. That's another clue. So anyway, you, know, you put all these little things together. Yeah, they don't prove anything at trial, but you add them all up. Yeah, they do. They do paint a good picture. You know, we talked to Luke. We ended up kicking him out of the office. The second time he comes back, he tells the same lies. And, and actually, this time, him and the AUSA got in it, and the AUSA kicked him out of the office. By the second time he came back, he's on an oxygen tank and says that his doctor says he's not able to stand trial and, and all this stuff, which was more investigation that we had to look at. But anyway, getting back to the source, we thought we were pretty good on, on Paul Johnson not being the source based on what his common wife law told us. And based on what everybody at the bachelor party told us, he wasn't there. He never worked for Disney. One of the things that Lucas told us at our interview was that he took the source to London, part of his payment. And he said the source did not want payment. You know, our question was, well, why would anybody give information to you to make a lot of money and not want payment? Right. Lucas's response to that was, well, he just wanted to help a friend out. And I said, OK, that's that's dumb. But OK, that's the answer you want to give. Long story short, we uh, indict him. We go to trial in 2013, okay, a week trial. We fly Disney down, or Disney actually brings their private jet down to Sherman, Texas, which is a small country town. We go through a week trial, and he is convicted within an hour by the jury. Very quick for a white-collar case. He ends up getting 17 years in jail, which is a hard sentence for a white-collar criminal, and that's how it ended up. Well... That was a fascinating case review. Again, I just love these fraud things because it's amazing to think of all the ways that people, all the things they do to steal somebody's money. My tagline, you know, for all the work that I do is with a gun, you can steal hundreds, but with a lie, you can steal millions. And this case is an example of how true that is. So again, the name of your book is Texcot Dreams lies and fraud. And it's available now. It's been out for a few months and it's available now for anyone who wants to hear all the other details. We've talked about a lot, but there are so many other details that we just didn't have time to explore. And so I recommend if people want to hear more, again, Texcot, Dreams, Lies, and Fraud, available at Amazon. Yep. Thank you very much, Jerry. So we're at the part of the interview where I ask you when and why you joined the FBI. Okay. So I joined the FBI in November of 1990. I was working as a bank examiner in San Antonio, Texas, and I had filed a criminal referral on a banker. And a couple of months later, a FBI agent came out and interviewed me about the reason I filed it and what went on. And I'm sitting there explaining to him, and I can tell that he doesn't really understand banking terms. And as we're going through the scenario of what the banker had done, I'm thinking, man, I could do this job. And about a week later, there's a big advertisement in the San Antonio Light newspaper that is requesting applicants for the Department of Justice, i.e. the FBI. So I went down there and applied, and a year later, I was in. So you had a fabulous career. We, you know, talked about it as, as we went through the case review, and then I read your bio at the beginning. Eventually, it all comes to an end. When did you retire? I retired in 2016. And what are you doing now? I started my own consulting and investigation business as soon as I retired. I do PI work now for various attorneys around town. Excellent. I like to give my guests the last word. What would you like to say? 
like to encourage anybody who listens that you should really consider a job with the FBI. It was a rewarding career. You have a blast doing the job, and you actually do some good where you see results of your efforts right away. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Rick Velasquez, a photo of Thomas Lucas Jr., images of the fake advertisement and preliminary concept plan for Frontier Disney, and FBI website and other news articles about the Disney theme park fraud case. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. And make sure you follow FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. This podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my monthly email, I keep you up to date on the FBI in books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, which is a colorful list of more than 50 books about the FBI written by the FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There is nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoir. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books in your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI in books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, fun for armchair detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler in Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.